Hey everybody, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to today's webinar, Getting Started with Code Rush, presented by Mark Miller, Chief Scientist, IDE Team, and Paul Usher, Technical Evangelist. In this webinar, learn how to increase your coding productivity with templates and code providers. See how Code Rush can detect and consolidate duplicate code and how quickly refactoring can be achieved. Plus, see how to customize Code Rush to yield maximum productivity without it getting in your way. There will be a live Q&A at the end of this presentation, so please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the questions section of your GoToWebinar control panel at any time. And again, thank you so much for joining us. I will now hand things over to Mark Miller and Paul Usher. Thanks, Amanda. Um, Paul's with me uh, from, um, from down in Australia, down under, uh, so he's going to be that Australian accent you hear. Um, normally, for folks who have heard us in the past, you've heard a, uh, a British accent. That uh, belongs to Rory. Rory is actually uh, with us, but uh, he's going to be helping out with questions. He won't be talking probably during this. Um, it'll just be Paul and I. Um, this webinar was uh, encouraged by Paul. He, he was, we were talking, and he was like, hey, you know what? I downloaded um, you know, the latest version. I installed. There was a lot of setup I had to do, and uh, let's help people through that. That was the essence of it. Does that sound right to you, Paul? Absolutely. Um, let's go through some of the basics and see how cool Code Rush is. Okay, so I'm on the DevExpress site. I'm going to actually take you from a fresh install of the product um, through configuration. We're going to download it, uh, install it, and uh, configure, and then we'll, we'll go through the features so you can see the features on it here. Here's the Code Rush installer, only 13.5 megabytes, so it'll be pretty quick. Here's the download. And uh, it comes to install. It's, it's going to be a registered installation. Um, my email is markm at getexpress.com. My password, tell you password, Bob. password is sysadmin, something like that. I don't remember. Anyway, here we go. We're going to click accept and install. We got about, I'm just going to take about 30, 40 seconds for this to install. So I'm going to just, I'll just, uh, uh, move this down to another screen, watch that, and meanwhile, I thought I would um, show the Code Rush page up here. Um, if you want to get the, the free trial, that's where you can get it to. You can click the download the free trial for folks who don't have it yet. Um, there's some, some, some killer features in here that we're going to show. One of them is the uh, debug visualizer, visualizer, which you'll, you'll see here. That, um, some great stuff is sort of here. You can click here to learn more about it. We're going to show those. Um, uh, we'll show some navigation features. Uh, we'll show um, some running tests, grading tests and running tests, uh, and we'll also show the code duplication detection. Now, um, one of the things that's going on is because we, when we first built Code Rush, here, I'll bring up the installer so you can see the, the, the progress on that. We're almost done. Um, when we created Code Rush, our priorities in, in the beginning were to create the most efficient, most productive tool that we could. Um, and so when there was a, an option, when there was a conflict between the way everything used to be, the way people were, the way they used to work, and the most efficient way to do it, we would, um, uh, we would favor the most efficient way of doing things. Um, and as a result, people who were with us from the beginning and moved forward ended up being very, very fast at writing code as they learned the new features. However, new folks who came in would maybe be a little bit surprised that, wait, this is not exactly what I expected. So we'll click Finish. We'll start a Visual Studio, and um, there it is. And um, we'll take a look at what what's going on inside the environment. And so, so what we and and so what we did to accommodate you know folks who might be installing and 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 as part of a larger suite of products, or might be installing and want to learn the product slowly is we created a, uh, a mode that we call friction-free. And the idea behind this mode is that we, um, uh, uh, things that were likely to maybe cause some, some surprises uh, for, for new developers, uh, we, would, uh, we disabled those features. And that's kind of what's going on here. So we've got a friction-free environment set up. Let's go up and we'll uh, create a, a new project and we'll, we'll take a look at, uh, at what's going on here. Let's do a... Uh, Hey Mark, while you do that, just uh, point out as well that uh, we're going to be looking at this inside the uh, VS 2013 um, release candidate. 
Right. I am inside Visual Studio 2013 release candidate, uh, and this is just the regular install right from the website, so it does work. There, um, there, there's like one feature that con conflicts with Visual Studio, and I actually prefer the Code Rush feature better than the, the new one in Visual Studio. Um, and and in, in this build, we don't have a smooth way of saying, hey, which one do you want? So you have to go into the options to decide which one you want. Um, well, we do have a smooth way to disable the Code Rush one. You'll see it when it, when it comes up. And it has to do with uh, the automatic closing of parens when you type in an opening parens. So, um, so here we are, and this is, this is what it looks like. Now, it's not too much different than regular 2013, with the exception of this toolbar, at least at this point. And if we start to explore this toolbar, we can see that, well, we've got something called code issues, and that's turned on. So we don't, I, there are no code issues to demonstrate here yet, but if we were to create, for example, um, let me just copy this and paste this method in uh, and uh, delete the implementation of it. And we'll call this one number, number, number two. And we should see, we might see a code issue coming up here. This is, if we just have a return type, oh, okay. So that makes sense. Let's type in, whoops, let's type in void instead. All right. So that's an example of a code rush code issue, and here's another one, member is not implemented. So these code issues are showing up because this is turned on. That little green circle right there means the feature is turned on. If I click it, I turn it off, and now we don't see it. If I click it again, code issues are on, and you can see this over here as well. You can see this bar and this little this bar showing up here that says this, this is not implemented. And if there's a fix available for it, then we can, then we can fix it. Like here, for example, we have redundant namespace reference. So here you can see it's dead code or redundant code. That's what that icon means right there. Um, if I click this, I can suppress this particular issue, um, always disable if I want, maybe only in C Sharp, or I can do it within this file or this um, application. Um, I can also have a fix for it called optimized namespace references, which takes all of the namespace references that we don't need and removes them. So I can just click there if I want to have an instant fix to it. And now we just have, we're left with the um, namespaces that we need, plus there are, um, within, the, within the product, within CodeRush, there's an options page that says, um, always make, make this one, call this one necessary, always call this one necessary, same thing here, and always show using system even though it's um, by default always there. So we have options to keep these here, and you could also clear these out completely if you set those options. So that's, that's kind of... Um, that's kind of a little bit of what you get if you don't do anything else. Um, you have a spell checker that you can turn on. Uh, you have member icons. If we click those, you can see the icons next to the members right there. You can click on those. You can change visibility if you want to, uh, or you can do things like select the entire method very quickly, um, comment it out. This, these are if your hands are on the mouse, that sort of thing. There are keyboard equivalents to these as well. Um, we can also um, move this to a particular region. So if we had a region already defined, we could select it from the list here, or we could add a set of favorite regions if we wanted to as well and move it to a region. So that's what the uh, member icons give us. Um, we also have flow break indicators. Um, I'll show that a little bit later, I think. Um, metrics, we can show metrics, just a little bit of that. So here's the metrics showing up here. If I click on this, there's showing me line count. I can change it to cyclomatic complexity. Uh, or maintenance complexity, which is a, a, a cool metric that tells you uh, um, how complex the method is. Um, structural highlighting, we have that as well. That draws lines um, between, uh, between matching blocks. Um, region painting, I think I'll show that later. And we have some other options as well, so you can kind of explore these and turn these on. Uh, this set of options right here for the test runner, so you can run and debug tests. Um, this is a, uh, an option uh, to make it, uh, one of the things that CodeRush does is it, as it works, is it creates a cache uh, for the solution of all of the things that it's parsed. And um, in the few rare cases, that cache can get out of sync with the code. And if you suspect that's the case, you can come up here and click this button right up here to clear that solution cache, and then, uh, and then it'll get a resync. It'll, it'll be a, a short delay while it reparses everything, and then you'll, uh, if that happens in the background, and then, then you'll get a resync on it. Um, this is for cleaning up, for code cleanup right here. Um, and this feature is for debugging. You can step into a member. And, uh, and so, so that's friction-free. 
Um, one of the things that Code Rush has are is something called templates. And I'm going to bring up the in the tool windows the Code Rush tool window. Let me bring it and put it up right over here. And as we move through the code, um, we should see the um, tool window update to, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, Code Rush tool window update to show me the um, uh, what I can do at each point as I move through the code. So here, for example, I'm inside of this and I can uh, create an if statement uh, by typing these, these letters in. For example, um, if I want to uh, check to see if, uh, if I want to create like a try finally, I can type in letters T and F like this. Um, and then over here it says uh, press uh, space to expand this template. Or, um, however, I'm in friction free, so it's going to be uh, the tab key. So tab key is going to expand that like that. So friction free sets tab key to expand templates. Templates are like code snippets um, on steroids. Um, so we type in TF like this. If I hit tab now, by the way, we'll get whatever is inside of, of IntelliSense like that, tab index. But if I drop that down, if I type in TF and hit escape and drop it down, and now I hit the tab key, then I'll get that block, that try finally block. Okay? So, um, by the way, Paul, if you can, for me, do um, look in the, um, uh, while, we're, while we're going, look and see if there are any questions as we're going along. And folks who are... Oh, yeah, Mr. Miller. Okay, do we have any that we need to answer at this time or no? Well, the first question was, what happens if the toolbar is not showing? And uh, Rory jumped in and answered that as well. So we've got answers uh, to those questions. Questions are show answers are showing up. So, yeah. now, often... Uh, I'm sorry? Some of the some of the things that um, that you're showing we'll, we'll cover in a little bit more depth um, in a little while as well. So at the moment it's just a bit of a, an overview um, as to the feature set. Okay, so we so here's what we did. We went in here and we said TF for try finally. I hit escape to drop that down. I hit the tab key, and then off to the side you may notice that we have this what happened, and and so normally when you hit a tab key it inserts a tab in the middle of the code, right? And so we have a conflict between normal behavior and what Code Rush is doing. And so this dialog will come up and it'll say, hey, what, here's what just happened. We just expanded this template. If this is what you want, you just hit OK, like that. And by the way, you can totally ignore that if you want to. If I type in TC for a try catch and I hit the tab key, I can keep going. I can just keep typing whatever I want and uh, it goes away. Right? It's not a modal dialog. Um, if I type in the TF and hit escape and then the tab key, now I don't see it anymore because I clicked OK on that. Um, if I type in TC, hit escape and hit the tab key, let's say I didn't want it, I could click disable if I wanted to. And that TC template would never expand again like that to get a try catch. Or I could click OK. How would I turn that back on, Mark, if I've disabled it and think, oh, I don't want that? That's a great question. Let's figure that out. So disable. I, you know, I don't remember how to do that. So Code Rush options. So I've just clicked Disable on it, and um, I think I'm going to go into Features first. There it is right there. Okay. So it's in Core Features, and a couple things are going on. When it, One of the options here is says Enable the What Happened pop-up. That was that window we just saw. You could clear it so we never see that again, and that might be something you do after a little bit. It might be if you're an expert, if you've been using Coders for a while, you don't want to see that, just clear that. It's in Core Features. The other thing is notice right down here, next to this TC template, there's an X, meaning don't do it. So if we wanted to expand, we just hit that. <coughs> Excuse me, just click it two times. Or we could clear it, and then it would ask us again the next time we did it. If we wanted to, it to, it to ask us. Okay? Make sense? Excellent. All right. So I'll just clear it out like that. And so now the next time we type in TC, we just escape hit the tab key. It's asked us what we want to do. We click OK on it this time, and then go back in the options, uh, features there, you'll see the green check has been added for us. Okay. Another quick question, Mark. Um, you, you're pressing escape and the tab key. Is there any way to have that so that I can minimize the number of keystrokes? So do I have to press escape to suppress the Visual Studio IntelliSense, or can that be disabled? Yes, you can. So um, inside options, incompatibility, IntelliSense, um, suppress intelligence says acceptance when potential templates exist. Okay, so we're going to say go ahead and suppress it. And so if we click OK now on this, 
And now we come in here and we type in TC. Now you see IntelliSense is suggesting that, but we also have a template to the left. So what that, that option is essentially saying to us is prioritize templates over IntelliSense. So now when I hit the tab key, oh, come on. That's right. I thought that was going to work. Let me let me look at that one more time. Maybe I misread that. No. So so that I was totally expecting that to work, and it and it's not. And I'm just going to have to look into it. I think it maybe um, uh, we'll, we'll have the devs look into it. Maybe something I'm I'm uh, that I have missed that I uh, am. Uh, let me try one other thing because I wanted to. Okay, so let me try it here. And the difference between this and the last one is that in the last one, IntelliSense had it. Uh, selected, right? Let me show you that. Here, IntelliSense has it selected. Okay, see it? Here, yeah. when I type in TF, it is not selected yet. Let me try Tab key here. Oh, it still didn't work. This could also be a 2013 issue as well. So we'll have all of the devs look at this. Let me just make a quick note for myself um, so I can uh, uh, talk to the devs about that later. All right. So this may be a Normally that should be working. It should prioritize um, uh, the template over the um, uh, the template over the um, uh, over the intelligence. Any other questions? Um, no, we'll be covering some of the uh, the questions that come up a bit later, so that's fine. Okay. So now what I want to do is um, I want to switch over into default mode, and the reason I want to do that is because it's it's personally more comfortable for me. Um, at least the default settings that are in there. So I'm going to switch over into default. And I'm also going to go in and I'm going to open it, bring in some templates that I've created just for this demo. And so one of the shortcuts to getting to the templates options page is this one. And one of the things, Paul, you were talking about is you were like, you were saying, um, you know, Mark, this template style, in fact, the whole thing is, looks a little daunting. There are a lot of options inside of CodeBrush. And so what we're going to try to do in this session is we're going to try to um, get you comfortable with those. These are my demo templates that I created. I'm just bringing these in. And here you can see these are the templates I've got here, CR1 through 10. And I'm going to click OK. So I've just imported some templates. And one of the cool things about templates is they're easy to share with other developers. You can share them in a, with a common uh, um, network setting where all the templates are stored if you want. Or you can export a section of the templates and, and give them to um, uh, send them to other developers. Um, OK. So we've switched over to default, and now let's do. I want to do one other. I just want to do one other thing. I think I've shown this before. Um, I want to just test this, make sure this is working. Let's use three by three on this. There we go. So this is cool. So um, this, we'll go ahead and say OK on this template. So I just created a three by three um, grid just by simply by typing in G uh, and three by three. By the way, this right here, I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, but uh, I can now give it a name. Uh, I can hit enter. I can give it a height, and a width, and I can specify what these um, uh, what these ranges are. Notice as I change one, it changes all the others below. I hit enter. Um, maybe I want to make this one uh, 60, and uh, this one like 70, for example. But it changes all the ones. I can just keep all three of those at 70, like that. Can, can we do that again, just in slow motion? Um, so you're saying that I can type in a couple of letters, create a grid, and just whacking some values, and everything else is done. Right. So G for grid, and then your dimensions. In fact, you can see over here in the template, uh, uh, in, in the coders training window, you've got some options that are listed here. And you can see what, you know, what these options are. So we could say G9 by, so I type in G9x like that, for example. And now I can just follow it up with another number right there, like 9 by 4, for example. Right? And then I can see what that's going to expand. I can, see, I can hit the space bar to then expand that. And now I have, um, we'll make this, uh, the height is uh, 900 by 900. Um, and we'll make these all 100 like this. And so now we've got that. That's cool. So yeah, you can very quickly do that. I just need to. Um, to change the uh, one as well, so I can see all of those. So there, I've just created the grid. Now, once you've created a grid, you know this is kind of a little bit off. But th th this is kind of showing the power of templates. If I come in here, I just type in B for button and hit the space bar, or if you go with the friction free, you're going to hit Tab key instead. It gives me a button right here, uh, button 
one like that. Let's call this button, I don't know, two by three like that. So I'm going to give it that name. And let's put it in the second column and the uh, third row. So what I can do is come in here to the grid and I can say uh, position control. And I can say let's go over uh, to the second column and down to the third row like that. It's two, three right there. And then hit enter. And then it just sets up the grid column pieces for me. So that's an example of a template that actually brings up a, um, you know, a, a dialogue. And all of these things are things you can, can create for yourself. If they're things you do all, those, all of the time. Um, if we do that one more time, like you say in slow motion, come down here, grid, position, control, come down here to the three, we can all, actually let's bring it up to uh, one and one. But we can also come in here and do something like this, where we can, I'm holding down the shift key now and moving around and changing the, the dimensions of this button and where it's going to be scanning. Now, I said I'd talk about this over here later. I'm going to talk about it right now. This, this, when you see this UI come up, this is telling you what keys you can press when you're um, uh, uh, in Code Rush to, um, to, to accomplish whatever task you want to do. So here, for example, we can uh, use the arrow keys to move the control. So I can just you know, up and down to move it around like that. Or uh, enter to commit the changes. Shift plus arrow change. I'm sorry, shift plus arrow keys extends the column row span. So like I said, hold on the shift key like this, move it this way or whatever I want. And then enter commits the changes. So just do that and fix those pieces. Okay. Now one question just came in, Mark. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, um, it's an excellent question. That is, does Code Rush provide any warnings for naming conventions? Um, you, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, I want Roy to answer that question because I think the answer is no out of the box and yes with a third party plugin. Um, I Correct. Think, I, I'm pretty sure that's the answer. Is that what Rory is saying? saying yes, yeah, so ba basically nothing specific out of the box, but there are some custom rules available via the uh, Style Ninja plugin. Yeah, so he's, Rory, can you put a link in there inside of the chat window if he hasn't done that already to that plugin so folks can get that? Um, and, and that's in there now. All right, good. That's what, and see, Rory's amazing and awesome even when he's not talking. So, um, so anyway, this, are, this is kind of an introduction to some of the templates that, that you've got in here. Um, and let's go, what I want to do next is I want to go open up um, uh, a, uh, the simple Code Rush demo out here that I've got. Um, I'll go ahead and save this in case I want to come back and look at it later. And let's see here. So I'm going to expand the CR1 template. And let's go in. I want to actually go in and I want to disable this um, pop-up, uh, at least for the for the rest of this, so we don't have this popping up all the time. So to do that, I'm going to, to do that. I'm going to go into Code Rush. I'm sorry. What were you going to say? Something? That would be one of the uh, the frequent questions that I get asked. Is okay. I, I, I'm new to Code Rush, and when I start doing things, I get all this all these dialogues popping up on screen. What is the cleanest way to minimize that as a new user? Well, if you're well, if you're if you're a new user and you are your intention is to uh, learn the product, then I would do what I'm doing here, which is let's go ahead and come in here and say uh, we're going to clear this option right here, and then click OK, and then that gets rid of that pop up. Um, the um, uh, if you if you are not going to do that though, if that's your intention is not to do that, then um, uh, then you might do this intermittently, I suppose. You might come in here and say, well, okay, I, I, I don't want it popping up at all for now. And you might say default to Visual Studio shortcuts as well, which means you won't get, there'll be no, when you hit the tab key, for example, um, uh, to, and you're in friction free and you wanted to expand a, a template, you wouldn't be able to expand the template because it would, mm -hmm. that would interfere. Um, so that would be, you know, I guess there are a number of options. It kind of depends on it depends on where you want to go on this. But if you want to dive in and learn, you want to watch some of the videos, then I would clear this off right here and I would just start learning is what I would do. And, and, learn about and certainly having the Code Rush training window um, open provides that interaction with any new features that you might be getting to grips with as well. Um, it does. There is some, definitely some of that interaction there inside of there. And not only will it show templates, but it will also show refactorings and things like that, refactorings and the code providers that you can use. So it does give you insight there. Now, having said this, let me let me just say this. The the I want to acknowledge that that the way we're doing this, where we're popping up that window, is not the best UI. It is not, and we are working to fix that and improve that in 13.2, uh, 
uh, which is likely to come out near the end of this year. So, so we are working to improve this for new users by the end of this year. So new users come in and, and we expect them to have a much smoother experience getting up to speed. Um, and we're also working on spending some time on training so that you can train right inside the product rather than watching a separate video or, um, uh, or, or, or looking at, you know, reading a blog post or something like that. So right inside Visual Studio, um, we're working on some, um, some cool training stuff that you should also see in the 13.2 kind of thing. But for now, I would, I would consider clearing this piece right here. So clearing that in the feature, so the feature pop-up doesn't appear anymore. And uh, we, we close the one that already exists. Um, and so this is just a, so this is a set of templates and a solution. I'm in a solution, and I have uh, added a reference to the end unit framework, and I have a single file called program.cs in the solution. And I started with a template called CR1. I'm going to close this down for now. Um, and we'll, uh, I'll maybe bring it up in a little bit later. Um, and, uh, and so the, the first template expands, it builds a program for me, and it says, here's what CodeRush does for you. And so you can see and read a little bit about what I thought was important to do in terms of talking about CodeRush. Um, then uh, I go to the next template, expand it, and it says, hey, you can write faster code without typos. For example, creating a new method, press M in the space bar. So I'm going to hit M, and then I'm going to hit the space bar, and then we get this, private void, method name, and, uh, and open friends. And uh, over here, we have this, this uh, UI, this window, the shortcuts window, telling us what keys we can press. And so we've got, a, it says text field active. And that's what this orange bar is around this, this, uh, um, this method name um, uh, text. And so the orange rectangle around it indicates it's a text field. That means that when I'm done typing in what I want it to, to be called, so I might call this like my proc or something like that, or, uh, or uh, is initialized, might be a better name for a method. When I'm done typing that in, I can hit enter, and then it takes me to the next field. So templates can have multiple fields. Remember the G3 by 3 template or the G9 by 4 template that we used, right? We we typed in G9 by 4, and then we it had all those fields, all those orange blocks, orange rectangles, for typing in, allowing us to type in the, the dimensions of the columns, right, and the, and the dimensions of the grid, the width of the columns, the height of the rows. So now we're inside here in the friends, and now we can use, continue to use templates um, and you know what, I've decided I'm going to actually bring that back out here, the tool window code is one, and we'll, we'll see it. And I think I'm going to bring one more out as well. Um, this is one that I copied uh, beforehand, before I installed, uh, into the plugins folder, so that after installing I would have it. And this is called the keys um, plugin. And I'm going to just enable that. Uh, so this is going to show me what keys I press. If I hit up arrow, for example, you see that. If I hit down arrow, you see the down arrow. So the keys I press are going to be down here, and the coder's training window is here. I'm using this keys tool window simply for the purpose of the, of the webinar so that we can go through. So I'm, I'm up here, and I'm going to say, I'm going to type in, I want a variable, so I'm going to type in V for variable, and now I want the type of the variable to be a string, so I'll type in S for string. And I can see over here that VS... Uh, all by itself is going to give me a string with the parameter name. So it's going to save me a couple of keystrokes. I don't have to type in string anymore. I just type in V for variable and S for string. And then I hit the space bar, and then I'm going to type in like whatever the parameter is, name I want it to be, like message. And I'm in a field, so I'm going to hit enter. And all it did is move the carrot to the end. I could have hit the end key as well, but enter is a bigger, easier key to hit. So now I'm going to hit the space bar, and I'm going to maybe do another parameter. Maybe this time a, a variable type Boolean. So I type in VB. And over here you can see that it's going to expand to this. And not only that, look at this, it's going to trim left, so it's going to get rid of that space I added, and it's going to insert a comma for me. And then the Boolean, Boolean de declaration. So I don't have a comma yet. I, haven't, I don't have to type that in. I just a space bar, a V for variable, and then B for the type. So I'm just going to hit space bar now, and then I'll say um, uh, uh, check engine or something like that. Hit enter. When I'm done declaring my variables, and I could have done this at the very beginning if I wanted no variables, no parameters at all, I just hit enter, and it takes me down inside the method. So with a very few keystrokes, right, you can see here's VP, 
right here. There's the template expanding the, um, right there. Uh, and then uh, check engine. That's why I typed in enter. So you're seeing that. You're seeing me type all those pieces in there, right? I'm just hitting enter to get down here. In fact, most of what I'm typing are the names of the identifiers. And that's really where you can get to with the templates. The templates can help you write code very, very quickly. So that's about, you know, as much as I'll get into templates now, we have separate videos to dive into templates and really show them, uh, show them off. So, um, so we can also write code from the consumer's perspective. So this is useful for TDD style development, um, uh, test driven development, uh, or, uh, or just consume first, um, uh, consume first uh, coding. And consumer first coding is essentially what you, where you write the client code and then you finish with the library code later. So the, the client makes the call into the library um, and it might, you know, it might do things like register classes, it might call services, things like that. You write those calls first and then you, you create the declarations and finish it up. And the reason you do that is because when you're in the client site, you often have the pieces that you want to work with in the shape that they're in. And so you make the calls and what happens from there, and what happens is your library it turns out to be much more appropriate for the client code than if separately it was built without knowledge of what the client code looks like. Does that make sense? I hope that was explained to a point where, where, where folks were getting that. Um, so here, for example, I have um, some client code that's been written. And, and, and maybe an example makes sense here. So I've got some client code that doesn't compile yet. I have these, um, these references to what I want to create as an enum here, and it doesn't exist. So I'm going to hit the code rich key on this, and I'm going to just say declare enum. So code rich key, by the way, is by default it's control plus the back tick, and you see it. But we also have an optional binding which binds it to num0 key. So I can hit num0 and, and bring it up as well. And I like num0 because I've got a wide keyboard, and the num0 key is right there next to my arrow keys is a really big fat key to hit, so I like using that. But if you don't, you can use control back tick, which is the key on my US keyboard, the key right underneath my tilde. So I'm going to choose declare enum, and um, uh, whoops, let me do an undo on this. I want to see if, uh, I was expecting it to get a little bit more than that. There we go. That's what I was expecting it to see. So it looks like the background person just hadn't picked those things up yet. But there you go, the diamonds, hearts, clubs, and spades. So what it does is it's actually scanning through um, all the code. And, and when it declares the enum, it's not only grabbing the one where you're at, but it's grabbing the other pieces. Um, let's say I were to uh, change this, for example, to uh, um, none like that. And maybe that's under my default instead. Let's change that. It makes more sense here to take this, put it here, for example. What I can do, since this doesn't exist, is come in here and just declare that element, and it'll just add it to the end. It shows me where we are. So, so, so this is something. This is this, by the way, is something that Code Rush does. It when it makes a change to code that's out of view, it takes you to that location and lets you see it, and then um, and then you can hit Escape to get back. So just hit Escape. And then we get right back to where we started. And so that's how that works. And you see that collect marker piece come in there. That, action, that, that arrow is an action hint, and it tells you what just happened. By the way, this is another option for turning things off, and it's inside of um, hinting, which is I think it's going to show up if we go into advanced. There it is right there. So hinting. If we go into advanced and go into action hints, you can click on test. You can see that's what they look like right there. And so we come in here and say, let's disable the action hints so we don't see it. You get a little bit cleaner environment. You can also, the shortcut hints, these are the pieces that, that pop up uh, that tell you what shortcuts you can, you can click and press. You can disable those as well. Um, and then also the same thing with uh, the billboard messages and the, the big hints. This is all from hinting. And you can turn all of this off if you choose to. So I'm going to just click OK on this. And uh, we'll hit Escape. We'll come down here. Here we have a new card. I'm going to come in here and say new card dot select, open paren, and here's the conflict in Visual Studio 2013 where both Code Rush and Visual Studio are trying to help out at the same time. Um, if that, uh, that you remember the, uh, the pop-up, the feature pop-up, the what happened pop-up that comes up? If we had not disabled that, that would show up and we could disable the Code Rush feature. Um, however, I actually want to turn off the Visual Studio feature because I like the Code Rush version of this better. We're going to go into Tools, Options, 
and uh, it's inside of um, text editor, C sharp, general, and it's automatic brace completion. So I'm going to turn that on and visual studio. So that's my preference. So now if I hit undo and I uh, I'm going to say select again, open paren, now just vote, code rush is there. So here, if I'm in a field, so that means I can hit enter to get outside. So it's just a fast way to get past that closing paren. Um, I can also just type the closing paren, and it'll just move me past it. Or, and this is one of my favorite features in Coder, it's just hit the semicolon right here, if you're in C sharp, and get out. By the way, you know, I've been showing this in C sharp this whole time. However, Code Rush is, uh, is relatively agnostic when it comes to what language you're working in. So for example, if you're working in Visual Basic, all the templates that I've shown you should work in Visual Basic as well. Uh, and, um, and all the features should work, and, and including the V for variable. So remember we used V for variable and then followed it with like S for string. That will work as well in Visual Basic. And in, if you know Visual Basic, you know that the declaration of the variable changes depending on whether it's the syntax changes depending on whether it's local, a field, or uh, a parameter. And Coders automatically figures out what it should be and gives you the correct syntax. So if you're a VB dev, um, everything that you're seeing here will work there. So here we've added a new method called select. We've got essentially um, some consume first development here where we're saying here's, we want to work with a card, we want to select it, we want to set it suit, its value, that sort of thing. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to just hit the coders key, choose declare class, and there it's built the class for us right there. And there's, it's built it just by scanning all of the code that's there. So not only do we get the class with the piece I was on, but we get a class with the suit property, the value property, a constructor, and the select method. Okay? I can hit escape to get back. Now all this code compiles. Now at, at the moment, Mark, that's all been extracted to, uh, to new files. It, what would happen if I wanted to uh, just have a class inside my class there? You know, I don't think we have an option to do this yet. Um, I, I need to research this. Um, it actually used to be the default behavior to put it right inside the same class, and then we were like, eh, I don't know. We were like, we didn't, we were, were thinking that that was not the best practice. And so we changed the default behavior to, to move it to another file. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, don't, I don't know if we have an option for this or how that works, but I'll need to get back to you on that. Can you make a note of this, Paul, and send me an email so we'll Absolutely. get a follow-up on this? And, um, and anybody who listening who does happen to know, if they know, they can you know, type it in the chat or, 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 or send us a... I know that it, it, certainly previously there was an option, a refactor option to extract the class to a separate file, which was cool. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm not sure what we're. I, I, yeah. So I don't know where, where we are on that. So so anyway, let's keep going. We'll keep going with the demo because I'm just looking at the time, and I want to make sure we have time to answer people's questions. And and so we'll we'll uh, we'll keep going on this. Um, I think meanwhile I, I want to uh, start a second instance of Visual Studio and, and load up a, a solution there. So I'm just going to do that. So here we're in a um, here we're in a uh, a class called Car. And it's saying, let's extract an interface from that. So we'll go ahead and do that. So I'll uh, hit the code rush key. And you can see here that there are, I see extract interface. And I also see extract interface down below as well. And the extract interface below has a Visual Studio icon. And what's going on here is we um, decided to allow access to Visual Studio's refactorings in addition to the code rush refactoring in case you wanted one place to get access to everything. So that's why you're seeing some duplicates here. Same thing with rename here. So we'll just choose extract interface. I'm just going to take everything that's public and build the interface for you. So there it is right there. Hit escape to get back. Pretty fast, pretty simple. Um, next, let's go on here in our car. Notice we've got this direction property right here. And uh, what we want to do is we want to wrap it up into a property. So we have a direction field and we want to wrap a, a field called direction. We want to wrap it in a property. So I'm going to hit the code rush key, and I'm going to say encapsulate field read only. So that's going to wrap it in a field. It'll ask me where I want to put it. I'll just put it there. I just hit enter to put it there. And now it's going to ask me to name it. If I hit the tab key here, um, uh, whoops. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. I know there are no other references to it. I hit the tab key and no other references, and I was like surprised. And I was like, oh, wait, because I haven't added it to the interface yet. So let's do that. We'll go ahead and do that. In fact, I think I have a, a, a set of instructions here that say, yeah, let's go ahead and add it to the interface. So we're going to come down here on the declaration, um, and we're going to hit the code rush key. And, 
and this is a good time to talk about the difference between the menu items in the top and the menu items in the bottom. So the menu items in the top are the refactoring. So these are things that are not going to change the behavior of the code, but they might um, make the code more flexible or easier to read. Down here, these may change the behavior of the code, uh, and they may also um, uh, declare things that don't exist. So th that's kind of what's going down in this part down here. So if we're going to add the interface, we're changing that interface icar, so, so that might break code. That's why it's down in the blue menu. Okay, so we're going to choose Add to Interface iCar. And now, um, if we hit the tab key there, you can see it right there, the direction of the code inside of it. So we can add pieces to the interface after if it's already implementing that interface. Okay, working with color, here I've got some color swatches here. Um, and you can see right inside the source code, we're calculating what the color is and drawing the color swatch right under the word color. I can click that. Example, and there you can see the color green, and there's the color green what, 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 and the components of that. And I can say, well, let's go ahead and change that. We'll make it uh, this kind of color orange. Click on OK there. And now it's changed the code, and the parsers just reparsed it, and there you can see the orange color swatch underneath it. So working with color is easier. That works in CSS files and uh, XAML files and C sharp DB files. Um, working with strings and localization, things like that. Here we have some uh, a, a display string that's concatenated. And if we are going to localize this into another language, uh, we'll have some problems because it's going to be hard to translate this. We want to, what we want to do is use string.format. So let's go with the carrot inside here. I'm going to hit the code rush key and I'm going to choose use string.format. This would be a good time to talk about the preview hinting that occurs. If I select a refactor and I just hover over it or move the arrow keys up or down without hitting enter, it gives me a preview, if it makes sense to give me a preview, showing me what the, how the code will change. So here you can see um, how this code is going to change. And we're going to make a string format call, and we'll pass in these parameters. So let's do that. And let's say that we know, well, miles is passed in here for this one. And it's a double. We know that when it comes out, it's just going to have like nine decimal places on it. And we want to change that. Whenever you want to change something in your code, you just generally you just hit the code rush key, right? And you'll see every refactoring available as well as all the code providers. And here I can choose format item. I can come in here and I can say, let's make it a number. Here's my preview. I can pass in whatever sample data I want. It's a live preview. So you, you, if I pass in something that doesn't make sense, you can see what the exception is. And I can you know, delete or whatever. And I can make all kinds of changes, specify leading zeros, decimal places, trailing zeros thousand separators, all of those things. And then when I've got what I want, I just click on OK. And there it's formatted for me. So I don't have to remember these anymore. I don't have to search online anymore. Same with date time now. Come in here, grab that. And you might say, well, you know what we want to do? We want to say like what the date is, what the month, spell that out, and the year. So this is like one of my favorite short, non-ambiguous date formats. I like this because it works regardless of what country you're from. So. Um, in terms of showing dates. And then there it is. It just spits it out for you. So that's nice. OK. And uh, running test cases. So we're going to just create a test fixture right now. Quickly, I'll just type in TF. Now, before you saw TF expand to try finally. But here, the preview hint says, no, you're going to create a test fixture. And that's because it depends on where it is. This is part of that um, on, temp on steroids part when I was describing templates. They're like snippets on steroids. And so um, we'll hit with the space bar, and uh, we get our test fixture. So the templates know where they are. They have an understanding context and can expand differently depending on where you, where you are. What's cool about this is you don't have to remember thousands and thousands of templates. You just remember simple rules. Like if I want something, I can figure out the abbreviation of what I want. So if I want a test fixture, I use TF. If I want try finally, I use TF. Right? You just go, but it's a simple rule rather than having to memorize all of these things. And so that's another very cool thing about the templates. So I'm on a field here. I can name the class. I'm just going to hit, uh, I guess I'll call it card tests. Hit enter. Come down here. We're going to call this uh, test is red, like that. And uh, I have a template. That just uh, This is for the demo that just adds a little bit of code um, that I added. But now I'm going to go back to the code rich templates. And there's a template called AT for assert true. So I type in AT like this, and you can see over here what my options are in terms of what I've got. If I type in like AF, I would get a cert is false, and then you can see it. And this works not only in NUnit, but works in all of the um, 
I want to say all of the known .NET testing frameworks that are out there. I say known because, um, yeah, I don't know, I suppose I could be, um, uh, there might be something that it doesn't work in, but it should. It should work in, in, in all of all of the, the known ones, certainly the major testing frameworks that are out there, and there are like something like five of them. So I've just typed in card.isread. It doesn't exist yet. I'm going to hit the code rush key, choose declare method. This is the target picker. Use up and down arrow keys. If you're not sure what you're looking at, you just look over here, declare method targeting. Up, move the target picker up, down, move it down. Enter, declare method at the target location. So these things can help you. If you don't want to see anymore, you just hit this red X, and this, this, this particular hint will never appear again. So this one for targeting will never show up again if I hit that red X right there. Um, again, I can, you know, we've seen, we've seen the option page already where I can turn that back on. So I'm just going to allow this to throw an exception for now. Is red throws an exception. I'm going to hit escape to get back. And now I'm going to come up here next to the test attribute. We've added an icon. We can click it and choose run test. It's going to run the test. It's compiling and building. And uh, we have one fail, a test that's failed. In fact, we can see that inside of the code right now. There it is right there. You can, uh, you can see that, the, uh, that that test has failed. You see the line that it's failed on. Um, I can hit the tab key to tab into it. That's a feature called tab to next reference. It essentially finds you all the references in your code. It's a great navigation feature. Um, and I can just type in, uh, this is another template I created just for the demo, just to very quickly type this piece in here. So we don't have this piece of code. And now we can go back in here, run it one more time. And then we should see a green check once it's run. There it is right there. And so now the test is passed. OK? All right, let's keep going. Um, let me do this. I want to show you the catalog for um, the code analysis. So let's type in catalog here. And this is one way that you can find options pages is you can just type in the piece that you're searching for right here. And code analysis catalog. This is what I wanted to show you. So these are all of the code analysis um, uh, pieces that we ship and with their default settings. Um, what, one of the ones that I wanted to show is undisposed local. And it by, is, by default, is turned off. Uh, and that's because, in some cases, uh, uh, it's, it's, we're unable to tell with absolute certainty that, that the, the local should be disposed. So it's kind of like a, you, you should double check this. However, it's very useful, so I'm going to turn this on. Um, and there are a few others in here as well that we turn off. Uh, and some of them are, are turned off simply because of uh, customers who, uh, the majority of customers did not want to be uh, alerted to that particular problem. And so, uh, you know, with, but some still did, so we keep it in. So, for example, can initialize conditionally is disabled by default. But it's also, I also personally find this useful because it can actually lead to code that is more efficient, that runs more efficiently. So I like to turn that one on as well. Let's turn that one on, click on OK. And so now with that turned on, you can see here that inside here we've got, a, it's found data set as a local. The data set is not being disposed of at all inside this code. We're just hitting the tab key to tap the next reference. And I can tap through all of those and see them. And there's no call to dispose, and it's not assigned to any other variables. Um, it's not passed out of this method. So it, it needs to be um, disposed of. So we can uh, solve it. We've seen a couple ways that we can solve it. We, one is we can hover over. Um, uh, hover over, over this and choose introduce a load using statement. You can also hit the code rush key to solve it. I'm just going to solve it here because my mouse is right here. And click it, and there we go. So we've solved it. Um, there's another thing we can do as well, um, and uh, uh, that that I that I, I like is kind of useful. I'm going to close this down so we can see more code here on screen. And and down here, what you see is we've got a for loop. And each time we go through the for loop, we're going to execute this bit of code right here. Right, we're going to go into data set. We're going to index tables of zero. Then we're going to go to dot rows property dot count minus one. We do this every time we go through the loop. And every time we go through the loop, we're going to go in. We're going to go in through the same get to rows, and we're also going to get the rows of i. And then we're going to go out into item array. We're going to do that twice here and over here. Okay. So one of the things you can do is if you see code like this, is you can select the expression that's repeated, and you can hit the code rush key. You can choose introduce local, replace all. So I can go ahead and do that. And I can do it even in, on non-intuitive breaks. Like right here, I'm actually selecting only to the indexer. Um, you could also include the indexer if it, if it made sense as well. Let me just show you that. If I, come, if I come back to just here, here's an example where I'm including the indexer and choosing introduce local, replace all, which I can do. 
So we'll just call this uh, row. So this row maybe. Like that. Okay. I can come in here and I can say, oh, well, you know what? This, I just found this. After doing it, I realized these are both occurring in the same place. And I can just call this items, like that. And then I might come over here and hit the code or key and say, let's inline that down. But then I might say, oh, wait a second. I see rows here and I also see it above. It's happening every time I go through the loop, and it's happening up above. So let's select this. We'll choose introduce local replace all, and we'll just call this rows. And now what we've done is we've made the code easier to read, and we've made it faster. Maybe not noticeably faster, but it's going to be faster because it's less code that's executing each time around. We're not going into the getter of each one of these. We're not going into the indexer each time. Probably not noticeably faster, but it's going to be faster. It's going to be more efficient code, which is code that I like to write. Okay. All right, um, let's show uh, the duplication, code duplication detection. Now, by default, this is turned off. And, um, and I think we're going to change that in the future and turn it on. But let me show you how to turn it on. You want to go in here, search for duplicate, and looking for duplicate code. And you want to turn this option on, analyze code duplicates, code for duplicates in the background thread. And the analysis level, this kind of corresponds to how much code is, you know, how small of a code is it going to consider a duplicate? So very low, it's going to, it's going to find very small, it's going to find expressions that are duplicate. And about here, it's going, to, it's going to need a few lines of code. And up here, it's going to need more. So these are larger blocks up here. These are smaller blocks down here. So it's slower. You get a bit of a performance hit um, if it's slower. But I, I like, my favorite is uh, analysis level round two. So those, those are the two changes I recommend. So we're going to click OK there. Um, and... Um, and now you can see over here it's checking and it's just found duplicates. So this icon means duplicates are found. Over here you see purple. Purple means we found duplicate code. And I'll show you the duplicate code we found. It's this method right here called min and this method here called max. And these methods were both copied over from the Embraco um, open source project. Uh, you know, one of the things we do is we look at open source projects and check them for duplicates, things like that. And, and so this is the, 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 these, this code uh, represents one of my favorite examples of duplicates. So we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and we can also hover over this as well to get the fix here. So we've got duplicate code consolidate to the current class, or I can choose an ancestor in the current project, a new class, a new class in a new project, or to another position. Um, what I'm going to do though is I'm going to click this button right here. Oh wait, let me show you these two buttons. This allows me to navigate through the different duplicates. So um, there's one of them, and there's the, there's, there's, uh, the other. Sorry, it's moving, my, uh, it's moving this off screen, but here we go. Click this, it takes me to one, there's the min, and move over here and do it again, and then it goes back to the max. So we can do that. The other thing I can do is I can come in here and I can click this button, which brings up the options. And I can also get that by clicking this button down. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I said brings up the options. It brings up the, the uh, duplicate code um, window. So I can actually see the duplicate code side by side. What's cool about this is if I hover over, for example, the max variable here, I see below that the min variable is highlighted. So that's cool. I can see all the pieces that are essentially the same when I'm, ho when I'm, when I'm hovering over those pieces. Um, also notice that max, one of the, a couple differences here. One of the differences is calculating max. Here it's passing in a different string. But the other thing is notice in my min method, it says this is a bug. Should the iterator count as zero? So I found a bug in one place, but not the other, not in the other place, which is actually not that uncommon. All right. So what I want to do is I want to get to the to the method that I like the best, which is going to be this one. I'm going to say let's start with this one, and we consolidate from here. So I consolidate from here. I'll say to the current class, and now it's the target picker asking me where I want to put it. We don't see the shortcut hint. Remember that shortcut hint that was showing up down here because I turned that off. I hit the red X. I'll just put it right there above the other two. And so now we have this method called min extracted. And now in min, we're calling min extracted and we're passing in parameters. Oh, you know, one thing, let me undo this a second because I didn't show you one of the pieces here. It's going to take a second for just to find the duplicates. There, found the duplicates. I'm going to bring this up one more time. The real difference between these two methods, and this is the same as it was on the Embraco source code, is, is, is right here. Here we're saying, min is equal to, and then we do a check to see if t is less than min, but here we're checking to see if t is greater than max. So it's, it's a difference in the code. Okay, Even though it's a difference in the code, Codebrush is just able to see that and consolidate it. So we can come in here, let's consolidate it to the, um, the current class, and we'll put it right up here, 
I'm going to call this a find edge, like find edge, like that. And inside here, I'm just going to tabulate refer reference on that func, and we can see that it is uh, it's showing up in two places. And we'll call this is farther out. So that'll be our farther out function. And so Codrush has declared that function in terms of what it takes and accepts, and then passed in the appropriate values for you right here and here. And uh, it's also pulled out the two different strings that were different in both of these. And it realized it needed to pass in an iterator. So it's like, a, it's like an extract method on steroids, but it consolidates duplicate code. Now, we have that comment here that says, hey, this is a bug. Should be iterator count equals zero. Let's fix it. Now we've just done the equivalent of fixing a bug in two places, right? With, in, but really fixing it in one. Right? The bug was in two places, and now I fixed it in one place. The cool thing about having that feature on and has seen those purple lines is if you're in maintenance mode and you're dealing with legacy code and you're going in and you're, you're, you're going into some code and you're fixing the bug and you see that purple line off to the left, that means you've got that bug somewhere else. And you can just hover over it and hit those arrow keys like I was showing you and see all the other places where that bug exists. It's really, really powerful. And you can consolidate it if you want to. Because consolidating, you know, we showed consolidation into a single class, but consolidation into another class is, is much more complex. And this can find if the duplication is in two descendants of the same class, and if you have source code to that class in your project or in your solution, they can then consolidate into that source code, right? Consolidate those two methods from two different files, two different classes, into a single ancestor method, if that exists. If it doesn't, then it can consolidate into a helper class and call that helper class from two different places. So like I say, it's an extract method. It's like an extract method on steroids specifically for dealing with duplicate code. It's very, very powerful. Now, the last thing I want to show, and then we'll, go, we'll just go into questions, but the last thing I want to show is I want to, let's see, file open, project solution, and I want to go into, I think, is it here? Drill down test. That's what I want. So I'll show you another cool, one-of-a-kind feature, not in any other product um, that's out there, and this is the debug visualizations that come with ProGrush. So I'm just opening up a, uh, um, a project that has um, some breakpoints in it, and I'm running it, and uh, there we're stopping at a breakpoint. So what does it do? It shows you, for example, values of uh, variables that are passed in. So here I can see days random is three, and I can see what the pickup time is. And as we're stepping through the code here, we can see what's going to happen as well. Um, let's actually, I want to, I'm going to set, uh, I want to come right up here. I want to change, excuse me here step down here. Oh, there's, you know, there's a feature that I turned off that I want to turn on on this. It's either turned off or it doesn't exist yet. It's not shipping yet, but, I, but um, it, it is um, debug. So I'm typing in debug up here. Give the bug visualizer. And there it is right there. That's the one I want. De-emphasize code outside the current execution path. It says it's in beta. Um, I, it's, it's safe to click on that. Um, I, I, I love this. Uh, so we'll click on this. And so now, let's go back up here. We'll step through, step. When we get to it, now, now what I love about this is it's de-emphasizing the code that's on the dead path, that's not on the execution path. So we have it even, we're just on this line, we're about to execute this line of code. From Visual Studio's stand, point of view, this line of code has not been executed yet. But from the debug visualizer's point of view, it's actually gone in and evaluated, and it knows the answer to the question. It knows that this is going to be false. What's really cool about this is that you get an alert before something unexpected happens as you're stepping through the code. So if you were expecting to go in here, and all of a sudden it goes gray as you get to that line, let me show you this again, just in slow motion right here. We come here, we hit F10, step over it, and then when we get to here, it de-emphasizes the line. It tells you this is going to be false. It shows you what it's going to be. It gives you a red X right over here as well. You get to this point, you're like, wait a minute, what's going on? Normally what happens when you get surprised, you have to hit F10 again, and now all of a sudden you're down here. And this line of code might be hundreds of lines of code away from where you were. And then you've got to go back and find where you were. You've got to come back and go up above it. You've got to set the breakpoint again. You've got to, you've got to maybe you know, check variables that might have been changed along the way. It's very, very hard to get back to that point where you want to explore. But what's cool is here with the, visual, the debug visualizer, we actually allow you to explore 
now at this point. And you can do it by hitting Alt plus the down arrow. So I'm um, just going to hit Alt the down arrow. Whoops, i got to be on the line of code. There, Alt down arrow. The expression visualizer piece comes up right here. This tells you all the keys that I can press on this. And now we can see it. We're drilling down in here. You see the values for the different pieces right underneath them. And so if I'm if I'm in here and I hit like for example the um, uh, let's do let's do the um, the tab key. I'm sorry, not tab key. Moving up and using the right and left arrow keys. So I move these arrow keys back and forth. Right, you can see that I'm selecting the corresponding expression. So I see this is true. Okay, this is false. This one's not evaluated yet. So even though this is open, might have a side effect, we don't need to evaluate it because we see all three of these expressions are anded. Uh, and because we have Boolean short circuiting going on, this one that's false is, is the one that determines the answer to the question why is this false? Okay, or why is it whatever value it is. So this is false. If we drill down to this by just hitting down arrow, we can see that the accident count five is not less than the number of uh, the minimum number of accidents that a customer must have to be able to rent a car. So we say that five is not less than three, that's why it's false, and that's why this whole thing returns false. What's cool is we still haven't executed this line of code yet. So we can come in here if we wanted to, for example, we can come in here on, you know, hover over min accidents is three, you know, click up over here and make a change to it. Whoops. I guess I have to add watch to do this. That doesn't make sense to me. Maybe this is a Visual Studio 2013 thing. I can't change this. Oh, is the reason I can't change this because it's constant? That's probably why. All right. That's probably why I'm, there we go. All right. So let's come up here and let's change it to two. And so now you can see I change it and now immediately we get this change to a green check indicating it is going to be true. This is true. And now this area down here is now de-emphasized. So that's an example of the debug visualizer. You can drill into pieces. You can see you can see all of these um, all of the pieces inside of there. Let me just hit run one more time, and and, uh, and again you can do this and, and show you that you can even drill into expressions passed to uh, uh, methods that have side effects. If you want to, you can click this to uh, to get to evaluate if you want to, and so you can see what's going on. Like I said, the green pieces here, or if you see um, uh, squares and square nodes over here. This, by the way, is a map just showing you how the expression lines up. So I come in here and I um, uh, and I and I uh, oops. all right. So I come in here and I uh, um, drill into the pieces. There you can see over on the right on the node map over here. You see how I'm drilling in, and I can drill in and see all the children here and see what these values are. Okay. All right. So that's the book visualizer. So. At this point, what I want to do is I want to say, okay, we've gone from an install of CodeRush, a fresh install. We've made some configuration changes. We're, we're, we're making it so it's uh, running, um, you know, maybe a little more efficient, running the way we like. We've turned off some of the options we don't, that are kind of, we're popping up and kind of distracting. And, and, um, and this, I think, is a great beginning. And the next step is um, to, uh, to go from there, and I think, um, to, to learn more. And we have, I don't know if we, uh, uh, I think you can get some of these links and put these in for me, Paul. Um, but I, I wanted to give people a couple links and just put them up in the browser. And oh, let right. people, and then you, you can also uh, paste them into the chat window. So this link right here is for the custom documentation. So we, one of the things we did to make the Coderish install so much smaller is we took all the com uh, documentation and put it online. So this here, is some documentation for CodeRush where you can learn more about features of CodeRush. Um, another link that you might find helpful is this one to get the latest um, shortcut keys. So right here you can get this in a PDF format so you can get this kind of cheat sheet and print it out if you want to. Um, if you want, if you like watching videos about CodeRush, this is a collection, of, uh, kind of a hierarchical collection of videos that can help somebody who's new to CodeRush getting started. Introduction to features, navigation. So we have videos focusing on particular feature sets like working with selections in the clipboard, consumers declaration, all of these things, right? Declaring and refactoring properties and events. Some 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 cool videos here with some um, some exciting exciting cool features. So you can look at that. That's very cool. 
Um, what else do I have? Oh, this one's a nice, this one's a fun site. This is the uh, CodeRush Community uh, plugin site. And this is managed by Rory, who's uh, online and been answering questions for us. Uh, and uh, you can get some uh, plugins here. You click on the Get Plugins link, and you see they're organized here by uh, category. There are a lot of plugins that are out here, um, plugins that are worked on by some of the Coders team members as well as community and, and some collaborative works as well, where both community and Coders team members um, work together to create a higher quality, uh, higher level of quality in the plugins that are out here. You can also, if you're... I think, so, sorry, Mark, I think that's a, a really important point to mention as well. The fact that the entire thing that Re uh, Code Rush is built on is the DX core and it is completely extendable. Yes, it is. In fact, every single feature that I've demonstrated was written in a plugin, right? The, the, the product uses itself to create its own features. And as a result, if you're a plugin developer, you can do amazingly powerful things. For example, if you wanted to create you know, if we didn't have a feature that already detected and consolidated duplicate code, you could create that feature. That feature just relies upon pieces that are in the core. Same thing with refactoring. If we didn't already have like a rename for refactoring, you could build your own. Um, so, uh, let's see. Is there any other links that I want to put up here? Um, oh, this is a good one. This is a blog from Rory from a while back. This is uh, Coders Resources right here. And so um, he's just got a list of things that are out there where you can get them online help, um, webinars, stuff like that, things like that that are out there. So um, I want to like spend time answering questions if we've got any at this point. Um, yeah, Amanda, there, are, by there, the... aren't many, uh, sorry, there aren't too many unanswered questions right now. Okay. Um, Rory, did, Rory did provide an answer to the earlier one about uh, extracting um, when you do the class um, automatic creation and it goes into a new file. There is an option in the options window to determine whether you want that inline or a new file. So if you jump into options and go to editor, code style, and then to type declarations, you can actually nominate whether you want that. So, uh, I mean, for example, my preference is to have it in the same file and then use a refactor to move it out if I want to. All right, let me try that, see if that works. All right, so we're in here. I'm going to create a new. Oh, we'll we'll say. Uh, I'll come here. I'll say um, new uh, sports car like this. And oh, this is by the way is a great feature of Code Rush. If you just type in something like this, hit the Code Rush key, choose declare local. It figures out the type, declares it for you. And now I can come in here and I can say sports car dot go. Then I call maybe go fast. Like that. And now I can come up here and say, let's declare class and see if it puts it in the same file. There you go, it's in the same file. It didn't like it because we're debugging, so let me stop debugging. That's why I just said, hey, you shouldn't do that. We're, we're, we can't handle that change. But now we've got it in there, so it's now in the same file. That's awesome. I'm glad. Was it Roy who came up with that? Absolutely. Good job, Roy. That is why you are the man. That's why we pay you the big bucks. All right, so then we've got sports car inside of there. So yes, the answer is we can. And then if you want to move it out, you just hit the coders key and you choose move type to file. Hit that. And now it's created a new file called sports car. Um, over in the solution explorer, you can see there it is right there. It's added it. And uh, so it's, it's fast and easy to do. Ultimately, if your goal is to be able to write code quickly, you know, create code, refactor code quickly, right? Coderush has everything you need. It takes a little bit of investment. Paul, you said something to me that totally resonated with something that I used to tell people all the time, which is, you know, what I recommend is in the morning you spend 10 minutes looking at a new feature, learning it. And then you spend the rest of the day practicing it, practicing that feature. And then what happens is at the end of the day you make that 10 minutes up, right? And if you do that after a week, you should be about 20% faster, right? And, and what's cool about the 20% faster, it's not so much that, hey, we're trying to we're get everybody to write more code in a shorter period of time. But what we're really, really allowing you to do is write code and think of more about the design than you're thinking about the mechanics of actually writing the code. That's what's cool about it, right? We're giving you more time to think about design and less time to think about, you know, oh, oh I just, you know, misspelled, you know, finally or something along those lines. The other thing that I find really useful as well, Mark, is if, I, if I've if i got to write a piece of code more than once, it's a prime time to use a template. 
Yes, it is. And we, we have videos on templates. I think one of those links that I showed you is a really nice one. Um, let's see. It, it's, uh, do we have the templates one inside of here? Advanced templates is what I was looking at. Here we go. Um, Coder's template deep dive. This one takes you deep inside and, and demystifies like so much of the complexity of, or at least the apparent complexity of templates and how they work. And so I recommend, I recommend looking at that. Um, I'm not sure we have an intro templates one in this list though. That may just be in the getting started. Yeah, it looks like that's the only template one right there. So, um, but I, but Roy, you can probably find another getting started with templates one. Um, we, I don't know if I want to spend the time now because we promised everybody an hour and we're like a little bit over. I just want to spend this time answering questions. So unless somebody specifically says, "Hey, I want to see that," um, I'm going to, uh, I won't show, uh, I won't really do an introduction to creating your own templates. We'll save that for later. One of the questions which um, we, we alluded to in the presentation was, how do you minimize IntelliSense's interference? Um, well, there is, so interference with, with the coders templates or with just yes, typing code? Just, just, re, just recap those, um, the options there as to um, you know, the interaction with IntelliSense. Okay, so it's inside uh, compatibility and IntelliSense, and and this is the option that I suspected was going to solve the problem, but it didn't. At least when we were using Tab Key, so um, uh, and when we were using switch over to Space Car Bar, it was. So this is we're gonna have to have the devs devs look into that and see what's going on with that. This might be um, this is possible that this is a Visual Studio 2013 issue. Um, uh, that may be what's going on there. Okay, so I think that that's something we have to look into, and, and that somehow in the implementation of IntelliSense Visual 2000, 2013, Visual Studio 2013, um, something uh, something changed, and so we need to uh, look at this. Okay. All right. Anything else, Paul? There's, there's no other questions there, but what I'd like to do is, is encourage everybody who's who's on the call this morning to. Uh, maybe send in uh, ideas and things that they'd like to see covered in a, a follow-up webinar, Mark, that we can start going into some features in a little bit more depth. I mean, there is so much and so much power behind Code Rush, um, and that with that little investment every day, the, the productivity gains over a month, over six months and a year is just outstanding. Uh, I know that Rory uses it. In fact, I, I'm pretty sure anybody who's who's got to grips with Code Rush, if you put them in front of a vanilla um, Visual Studio would be lost now. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that that once you get used to Code Rush, um, if suddenly you're without it, uh, it gets a little frustrating because you're expecting you're expecting things to happen and they don't. Um, Absolutely. So you're like, oh, I've got to install Code Rush to make this work. Yeah, there's a little bit of dependency there, and I think part of it is it's it's kind of like you know. If you're getting in a really fast sports car and taking a drive, and then you know having to trade that in for a tricycle, you know when you're in the tricycle, you're thinking, "Geez, I wish I was in the sports car," right? So there's there's some de dependency there, and so for anybody who might have to actually sit on a tricycle from time to time, they maybe don't want to ever sit in that you know sports car because they don't want to experience that because they don't ever want to feel the feeling of you know wanting it. But um, but you know I think the benefits outweigh right the the um, you know that kind of you know downside and or or, or percent potentially perceived downside um, uh, you know the the ability to write code while somebody else is talking to you for example in like a pair programming situation or a design meeting or prototyping with a customer or something along those lines the ability to write code very quickly is powerful if you have it you know once you have that ability um, giving it up is hard to do. Uh, the other thing that is really useful for is like you know one of the things I do is I, I present to developers sometime and if anybody who's listening ever wants to present or does present to developers, one of the things that sometimes happens in the session in the presentation, even if it's not to a big audience, even if it's just to your team, is somebody says, well, what about this? What happens if we do this? And one of the cool things about being able to write code very quickly, being able to create classes, methods, properties, all of that stuff very very quickly, a few keystrokes. It allows you to essentially live code in front of an audience and build it up and answer that question very quickly. And anybody who sees a presentation that runs like that ends up going away incre incredibly impressed. 
right? And, and so it's, it's very powerful, very useful for that kind of live, fast prototyping. Or simply if you just want to spend more time thinking about the design and less time thinking about, you know, how do I, you know, how do I, uh, you know, type in, you know, method or, or not method, but uh, public or something like that. Right? How do I get the syntax correct? Okay, so have we wrapped up all the questions? We have the, the last one was just a um, how to turn on the debug visualizer again, but that's under options, editor, debug, visualizer, and hit the enable flag. Yeah, so I think that was that, that was uh, that was that off by default. I, I forget if we. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So um, so that was something that we had to enable. No, it was the other this option, was on. The other option you liked in there was the uh, the, yeah, the, the, the emphasize feature. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this was enabled. I thought that was, I don't think I had to change that. It's just this one is the one that was disabled. And that's the one I wanted, wanted to turn on. Well, in, in the 13.2, we'll have that on by default, I think. Um, and so people can turn that off if they want to. But yeah, I find this really useful. It, it helps guide my eyes to the right place as I'm stepping through the code. And it catches surprises in advance. It helps me catch surprises in advance. So I like that a lot. So yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, so uh, I agree with Paul. If you have suggestions, Paul, did you give him like a, a place to send those suggestions to? I'll type that in now. Paul's going to type that in. And um, my email address, uh, I think you saw at the beginning when I typed it in on registers, markm at devexpress.com. I'll stick that in the chat window. And um, and we can, uh, we can, with that, I can pass it off to Amanda and, and she can uh, get us out of here. Thanks, Amanda. Hey, Mark. Um, and Paul, uh, we did have one more question pop in. Is Code Rush for VS 2010 and greater only? Um, we have older versions of Code Rush that work in 2008, 2005, and even 2003. So, however, the latest version of Code Rush is for 2010 and up. We discontinued support for 2008 um, uh, recently, with the latest version, because we're we're adding new features that were de depended upon. Um, new changes in Visual Studio 2010 and up. So that's what's going on there. Okay, great. Okay. All right, perfect. So everybody, um, keep an eye out for uh, upcoming Code Rush webinars at uh, devexpress.com slash webinars. This webinar uh, was also recorded, and I will post it uh, later today to our DevExpress YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and watch it um, in slow motion, you can do that. And uh, you'll also get a follow-up email from us with uh, those upcoming uh, Code Rush, you know, more in-depth sessions as well. All right. So thanks to Mark and to Paul for uh, presenting and for answering questions, and to Rory for also answering all those questions uh, behind the scenes. And of course, thank you all for joining us. Thanks for choosing DevExpress. Bye-bye.